Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are back. We're so back. Uh, this is probably like my once a quarter conversation with my good friend uh, Dimes from Blood Satellite. Dimes, how the hell are you? Good, good. I love that intro. It's got such vim and vigor. When I start, start my podcast, it's like, ah, I shit my headphones. <laughs> ah, geez. I'm leaving this in. Oh, I, I, was, I, I was doing that yesterday. I was like, ah, we'll put something in and post. And then I was like, ah, I never edit my stuff. What am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I did a bathroom on my computer. <laughs> um. I know it feels weird talking to you again so recently because we just did the Boomer Zoomer panel that you had hosted. And honest to God, uh, as frustrating as that panel was, it was incredibly important because to listen to Herb and realize that that Boomer is real and he's not some Murdoch Murdoch like R the Donald <laughs> caricature of Boomers, I think was yeah. really important for people to hear. Well, I said that on my show too, which is, you know, Steve Saylor, who everyone loves Steve Saylor and you're a very well-traveled and well-liked. And so are, is everyone else on the panel, but I'm like, Herb is the star. Herb, it was, you could not ask for more of a boomer archetype. And I'm like, we needed that because we could have gotten a boomer, even though they are very difficult to get a hold of. Um, and they don't usually do live streams, but I'm like, he's, I couldn't ask for more pure uncut, baby boomer and i'm like well here he is S talk to him and uh you could just imagine me everyone's like oh man what's what's dimes think right now i got a smiling ear to ear looking at the chat picking which ones to highlight because people are losing their minds but that's what you want you know? <laughs> um, yeah, you're you, yeah you really did in that instance and i think you got exactly what you wanted um, so the title I have for our discussion today is something I'm trying to coin and to take off, which is called the consultancy crisis, in part because consultants are required for almost everything in my government these days. Um, you know, the largest, you know, consulting firm slash advertiser firm, McKinsey, is one of, you know, it gets millions of millions and billions of dollars from the federal government uh, every year, there are numerous consulting firms that help run various IT systems with the Department of Health and Human Services. There's a California tech company that gets like a $135 million uh, award. You know, you can look all this up at systems of award management and all that other stuff to find out, you know, where these guys are going and getting their dollars. And I think that's sort of an important thing to consider is, is that for those who work in advertising or those who work in NGOs or nonprofits, like I do, I, I work in government, but in sort of the grant space, that it's important for us to look at another part of the elephant. You know, everyone's kind of grabbing a part of this animal and trying to tell you what it is. And this is, an, I think, an under discussed side of it, because we talk about academia, we talk about the media, we talk about the state and the glowies and the intelligence agencies. But I think the other side of this, of course, is just the nasty conglomeration of grant dollars, these consulting firms, and uh, the advertising and messaging that goes into it. So uh, you and I get to play a little bit of insider baseball, but instead of talking shit about other e-celebrities, we're, we're going to talk shit about our jobs. <laughs> you should hear us do our secret podcast, which we don't record. It's just us chatting and every time we do it like man we should just have a show together but half of what we talk about is unairable let's just say that <laughs> um that, so that, from your side dimes uh, being in the great white north although it's more of like the the great white northern province of india at this point you, you work in yeah, yeah go ahead. Say, my buddy i co-host judas you know, f fairly recently, as an adult man, he said, I thought they called us the Great White North because it was full of white people. And I said, no, I think it's because of the snow. But there, like there was a time where I think you could be confused by saying, oh, yeah, no, it's the Great White North because it's like 99 percent white guys, not even white women. This was just a, a nation of the fellas. And then, you know you let a couple women in and then it's half Indians. Now look how fast it happens happened within my lifetime. 
Yeah, it, it's insane. I mean, unfortunately, my uh, the the great white aspect of America kind of started long before my lifetime. But you work in advertising, and we're going to try really hard not to get ourselves in trouble by inadvertently doxing ourselves. But I mean, you, you've made this your kind of this has been your career. This hasn't been something you've recently done or jumped ship yeah. to. Yeah, I, I would say over. I haven't actually kept count of because the years have blurred together over COVID. I would say well over a decade working in advertising and marketing uh, mm -hmm. here in Canada um, in a, a variety of places. There's agency side I've worked at, client side, where you're just doing marketing for a company. And then also in uh, the startup space and with some nonprofits as well. So I'm hoping to bring the nonprofit experience to bear here because I think that's the most relevant, although it does really smear together. Um, and I worked in this industry, I'm in my thirties now, so I had a whole other career before that, but, um, yeah, I've worked in a lot of different areas of marketing as well, uh, on the creative side, on the account side. And, you know, I don't know how interested people are in how these organizations are set up, but I, I think it does matter because you can compare the organizational structure of an agency to a nonprofit and to a government bureaucracy. And there's actually a lot of you know, similarities between the two. But yeah, I um, I have you know at various times I've worked on political campaigns. Uh, I've worked with nonprofits, as I said. My wife also works in the industry, um, and she has worked in the government as well. So I've got her stories that I'm going to repurpose as my own. I've never worked in the government, but I've helped her on some projects. And uh, it says I don't know. If, maybe it's different in America. I would hazard to guess that a government bureaucracies once you get deep enough are about the same in both countries. But I, I'd yeah. imagine that they're very similar outside of perhaps it being parliamentary, and then of course America having its Congress and such. But I one of the things that also inspired this talk was I was recently also at a sort of professional development conference and someone from the uh department the united states department of agriculture was at this conference talking about usda rural development grants and rural development is very important in respects to fly over america because it doesn't just go to farmers or anything like that it goes to these small rural communities for all kinds of needs with respects to infrastructure utilities energy building historic preservation disaster relief etc and this woman this very lanky you know new england waspy lady was opening her talk with a reference to fdr and the new deal and i had said that the the fdr's new deal still holds great mythopoetic status in america and someone with a flag in their bio that I, I'm not the world's biggest fan of was just like, well, here's a <laughs> sniff test for that. Is there movies made about the new deal? And I said, that is a terrible fucking standard for political narratives. <laughs> I said, because if you haven't listened to Democrats for the last 70 fucking years, you would think that FDR is irrelevant. Despite the fact that on countless campaign trails, there has been new deal rhetoric throughout the democratic base everyone wants to be fdr you know obama wanted to do a, a radical transformation like fdr he's invoked fdr in his speeches you have the green new deal you had prior to the you know progressive midterm election in 2018 you had in 2014 nancy pelosi and chuck schumer trying to go with a, a fair new deal or a fairer deal kind of messaging to get democrats on board when obviously Republicans did very well in the 2014 election. And so it, it's everywhere. And it's still even now in this administration about the New Deal. And because of that, and because the revolution came and went, I would recommend, you know, if you want the American libertarian perspective, go read The People's Pottage, especially The Revolution Was by Peter Edwin Garrett. It's a great read, still holds true. And, you know, I'm listening to this person talk and she goes off and she says, yeah, we're doing a lot of work with these like rural technology centers and we're dealing with Marshall Marshallese Islanders because apparently Arkansas has the highest population of Marshallese Islanders in their diaspora anywhere in the world outside of the fucking Marshall Islands. I was going to say, I don't know anything about this group. I'm imagining people in like, like weird, you know, 
straw skirts. You know, I'm imagining like people with like seven foot bows and arrows. Is that accurate? Uh, I I wish, but no. Uh, that'd be a little <laughs> more interesting. No, they're they're kind of they remind me of Samoans, but not as fat. And I, I'm, I'm hearing a lot. Of, this... I hear a lot of like uh, straw skirt type talk here. No, yeah, well, you know, not the photos we saw. It was a bunch of uh, chubby, uh, you know, Pacific Islanders in in blue jeans. But you know. <laughs> And so I'm, I'm I'm sitting here and I like this. There are all these open dinner tables and everything. And I'm just thinking to myself, I'm writing on this little notepad and I'm like, kind of like going on my credentialist Twitter account while I'm surrounded by like professional bureaucrats and progressives. And I'm like, it's just you filling these... out the notebook from American psycho. It's just as you yeah, page, just, just like murder drawings. And, and I'm just like dropping my pen as I hear other progressive slop come out of this woman's ears. But I'm just thinking to myself and I'm, I'm like quietly scribbling in like my like shitty cursive handwriting i'm like why are these people here and but it raises an important point that so much of what we talk about online and i've said this elsewhere we get really caught up in metapolitics which i which is which is a good thing i'm not shitting on metapolitics we do it all the time um but also we focus on these grand metapolitical narratives about washington and civilizations and Spangler, the decline of the West, and like Nordicism or Atlanticism or Duganism or whatever. And I just think to myself, actually, a lot of the problems have like names, office numbers, like a whole org chart with a respective government bureaucracy that you could like attack or try to defund and go for it. And I don't see enough attention on that, maybe because it's so closely tied to what gets called normie politics. But normie politics still affects your regular, everyday, normal life. Yeah, I, I hate to say that it's like a drug because that seems too simplistic. But a, a lot of these grand meta narratives, they grab hold of your soul when you first hear them. And that's exciting to a lot of people. But the next step after that should be drilling down into the details. You know, one example would be you hear about, oh, we need um, we need patronage networks or we need retribalization we or a parallel society that's the big one right now we need a parallel society and you say yes that speaks to me on some existential level but you never graduate to how do we build one what does that look like what's step one through 50 of that and you can and there's a lot of great books and a lot of great thinkers who actually have a model laid out of what that looks like but it's very easy to for people to get stuck on some sort of metapolitical plantation where you just kind of debate these like fandoms against each other um, with these like sp grand, grand Spenglerian identities about civilizations as if they're organisms and then they're just battling each other. And it's, wow, it sounds a lot like Godzilla. It sounds like a lot of like these big organisms trying to like fight for their lives, but that's impossible for an individual to really engage with because it's kind of scary, I guess, or it's very complicated, or you have to really sit down for a while and think about it. I don't think most people want to, or they don't have the patience for it, but you know, they're not really doing much of anything else. So I think that's why this stream is so essential. And this kind of ties into the live stream panel we have, which is let's actually start hashing this out. What's a five-year plan look like? And we'll probably talk about this at some point, um, but just to tease this out, that's why I was so interested. I'm not a huge advocate of it, but I am interested in it, in that Project 2025 movement, which is a very nuts and bolts scheme to be like, okay, how do we get our guys into the organs of power? Forget elections, forget getting our guy as president or as governor or MP or whatever. Let's just, how do we get people in like middle into the managerial elite? Because that's way easier to do. And maybe that actually matters more. If we, instead of getting one guy elected, we get 5,000 guys hired. I'm like, well, that's, that's actually doable or at least seems more doable than, you know, finding a superhero to lead the nation as the new philosopher king, which is what some people think, you know, Trump is going to be. Yeah. And as someone who works in middle management of bureaucracy and government, I was, you know, when I, and I've been doing grant work for several, several years now. I, I want to say so, it's about, oh, about seven years of doing this on and off um, in between some legal work and some political campaigning work that I've done. Uh, and so I, I kind of like 
it's always interesting when I hear people talk about like, oh, I'm going to vote. And it's like voting is actually like the lowest effort thing you could ever possibly do. And you should vote, even if you don't think it does anything. You should do it anyway. But secondly, it's the it's the organizing, networking, having dinners with boring people whose titles you don't want to fucking remember and trying to see what it is that you can actually do. Uh, we Imagine about just going yeah. to meetings for the rest of your life. That's honestly, that's like 80% of a lot of like government work and it sucks. Um, and, uh, and again, it's a huge turnoff, but you have to have some desire to do it, I guess, in that respect. Cause I mean, obviously the idea of the public servant is dead, but there are a lot of people who are sold that political narrative that you are a, a faithful public servant to the citizens of the country or your state or whatever. And there's a, there, and if you're a white guy who is like raised with like that constitutional, I love America perspective, that is like you staring at the, the, the bottle of Vicodin, like Dr. House, like, you know, you shouldn't, <laughs> but you're addicted to it. Cause like, there's that like hit of like normie constitutional civic nationalism. And you're like, Oh, Hamilton. And like, you're ready to just like go back to rah, rah, 1776 <laughs> again. And it's a powerful thing. But at the same time, you know, you, you look at reality and it's like, oh, this is just mo money for dim programs on like a federal scale of untold billions of dollars uh, or millions, depending on what, what you work in. So, I mean, it's it's important to consider that because for you're right. We do talk about patronage a lot. But what, what does patronage look like? Well, patronage on a local level is someone's economic development officer for their respective city, making sure that when things go out for bid and for contract, they let their favorite buddies who have an engineering or a contracting company know ahead of time. That way they can put the bid in and kind of underbid it. So they always get selected and they're the ones that get the job and the money. And then they kind of get the kickback going. That's what it looks like on sort of this like niche local municipality level. And then of course, on the federal level, we kind of know what that looks like just because anyone can look at America's like racial situation and know exactly how that patronage network. Yeah. Um, works. It, that, that to me is fascinating too, because whenever I've had to deal with that, I like that more than what you're taught, which is that this is just a, a group of individuals pursuing their self-interest. Once you understand what the real, you know, backroom power plays are, you're like, okay, so what I really need to do, I don't need a pitch deck. I don't need to give a big speech. I need to get these two people to like me and then I can kind of do whatever I want. To some people that sounds corrupt, but I'm like, but that's the world in a sense. But I'm like, that's again, a solution to a problem. And we, we touched on something there very, very briefly. And I've, I've discussed this on our show um, because some people want to accelerate the collapse of everything because they think a lot of these institutions are irredeemable and many of them probably are. Um, but there's something to be said for the actual human capital that is in these organizations being the real problem by which i mean if you just clear them out as bowden would say and repopulate them with people that are more aligned with our outlook we can actually do good so and there's two different types of people i'm talking about here so it takes someone like you like i want to be in this position because i want to accomplish a task I want to allocate capital to areas that I think deserve it. But you're up against a whole group of people, I would say most of the bureaucracy, which is they're just there for status. They actually don't want to do anything. They just like that they're in the machine and they'll do whatever they can to just perpetuate their place there because it's status, because it's prestige, but they don't actually want to do anything. So you're always run. These are like the two sides that are at war in every organization. But I think when people think, I think that other people think when they get involved in these organizations, they just need to be a cog in a machine. But if they think of it like you, like, no, I have a purpose. I'm only here to accomplish a task. These people don't have fucking tasks. They just have a state of being that they want to cling to. But with you, if you have a task, then you have an orientation in the world and in life. And that that's a horizon you could run towards. So it's like, I want to get this kind of you know boring job, but I can actually do good with it. You'd be shocked at how many people in government don't actually want to do anything good or bad. They actually just want to, they love the idea of you know, an email going around in a circle for a year and nothing happens because they just like being there, you know? So you don't need to become that person. You could be like the credentialist here. And one of the things I did notice 
for what I do, and I'm going to work really hard not to dox myself, but I at this at this professional development thing, which was a regional thing that worked with the Economic Development Administration, and I'll leave it at that. They, it was predominantly Gen X white people who were doing things. And also the younger people, so I'm talking about anyone under the age of, let's say, 45. This is when things got, that's when it got diversified real quick. And there were a lot of white people who were there who were my age or slightly older or slightly younger. But then also you could tell that it was way more non-white the younger you got. And I was like, so this is what we mean by competency crisis. Or at least that's what that's not what people would say. Although I don't know how competent these people are. But also that you're talking about organizations that are to plan, develop, execute, monitor, and close out, you know, 10 plus million dollar grant projects for the development of wastewater treatment plants, tech centers, uh, you know, municipal remodeling, et cetera. And so, and these people have to be intimately familiar with things like the National Environmental Policy Act. So anytime that you want to build something with federal dollars in America, you got to do a NEPA review. And because I live in the middle of the country, part of my NEPA review for anything that we want to do is taking a picture of where this project is located, i.e. the middle of the fucking country, and just putting it in the context of the United States. We are nowhere near any coastal barriers or coastal protection zones. Done. 15 more environmental things to review and go over, like floodplains and etc. And no one talks about these things because we just assume that the either the government's going to collapse or this doesn't mean anything or we can just replace it with our guys. And this is where I go real back and forth about one of the things that you and I were talking about before the show began, or this recording at least, is entryism. I don't know how much of this anti-entryism has been around. Again, I came to the scene October 2020, so I don't have the greatest historical insight for this talking point being around. Because prior to me being the prudentialist, I was also, you know... Mr. So-and-so, who worked on various political campaigns in the Republican Party, who went to the state convention in 2016, who did a lot of local government work to, you know, push for certain candidates and try and rig the Democratic primary where I lived at the time to get a more conservative candidate. Half your audience is on LinkedIn looking at Mr. So-and-so, and and there's just one, like, Korean guy who's going to be getting a lot of messages soon. (laughs) Oh, yeah, right. (laughs) I, I don't want to end up in a situation. This will this will definitely age the the recording, but I don't want to end up in a situation like Martin and Will Stansel <laughs> Fox is out there, and some poor bastard from the Pacific Northwest is being called a Nazi all the time. I don't want that to happen to somebody. Sorry, I, I completely derailed the first of many. I'm sure. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. This, this is why every time we record, we should say we have our own show. But nevertheless. Um, so all, all these things happen and we don't talk about it. Instead, if you're like a neo-reactionary, you're just like, well, we don't need them. Just retire all government employees or the Heritage Foundation. Like, Well, let's just make it easier to fire them if they don't want to go along with the president's ideas. Or, you know, we can just staff them with our people that are consolidated under something that we have control over. And I, I still think that the nitty gritty of these things is important because. Well, America might Brazilify or it might balkanize or whatever. And there's some instances in, in certain places of both, but you're going to still deal with a very bloated, ugly federal government that is technically supposed to give out millions and billions of dollars in grants, in programs, facilities, utilities, etc. And maybe it would help on both a local, state, and federal level to have some people that know what they're doing. And about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, I can't tell you now at this point, I had Jeremy Carl from the Claremont Institute on, and he's more famous now because he wrote that book on anti-white racism in America. But I asked him, well, where are all of the policy wonks? Like, where are my people, you know, sort of the... um, I guess, you know, autodidactic tuds. Well, why aren't why aren't we in government? You know, and he's and he's basically like, well, where are you guys? And that's a fair, <laughs> that's a fair, that's a fair criticism because I again I don't know how much of this anti 
entryism is in there. There are some places where, like, yeah, if it's academia, good luck. Because if not, you're gonna have to put on like the minstrel show and do this like routine where like you you wake up in the morning and you look into the mirror and you're doing the American Psycho routine. It's just like yeah. my name and, is and Richard also, Hanania. I live in Austin, Texas. I am 37 years yeah, old. Yeah, and, and also something that doesn't get brought up is that historically people used to believe in universities and i think we've lost that especially young white men if you would think of a harvard yale princeton or any of the and with good reason multitudinous you know secondary schools you know even colleges people really believed in their colleges they were members of alumni networks now i i would hazard a guess that if you were to ask most white guys regardless of the school they will say i'm there for a piece of paper i'm not here because i believe in this institution it's very cynical the reason that they're there so it's like you know no one believes in the institution anymore and so you know, they're kind of looking for ways to check out. And it said they would leave if they could. They would leave if this wasn't sort of an academic shakedown for credentialism that you need to go there. Um, the spirit is gone. And you're not going to find that in non-white guys, frankly. And well, if I could, and and if that, I could also say oh, that, that that's a um, that's the endemic problem, which is that why people on our side, let's just say the right broadly are against entryism is because they're convinced like in academia that the system is aligned against them. And they've convinced themselves that any, any negotiation or any employment within that system is strengthening it. And in their good conscience, they can't do that. And what I noticed with guys on our side, it's, it's about values. It's about first principles. Like I refuse to play this game because you know they they it, they it hates me you know and i don't think you get that from anywhere on the left even if they don't like like you'll see more anti-government leftists get excited about town council meetings than you will with like a trad right winger and i think that's relevant and, and this is where you'll get the hanania type saying that left wingers care more and to some extent there's truth to that statement however this is why again the entryism thing gets beaten out so much is because you have to look at those institutions. No one believes in Harvard or Columbia or even their state school or where they're from, despite the fact that, you know, college football, I, I would argue, is more patrician than the NFL. But that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, because you have to look at like, well, Obama's dear colleague letter, like you basically made. You know, the co your college years of rampant sexual fun, quote unquote, um, illegal. And we have extrajudicial means inside the university to basically label you as a rapist and you can't do anything about that. Fraternities, you know, the 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 actual networking white boy ethnic mafias that existed on these college campuses long before, you know, a lot of these Ellis Islanders came around. That was also thoroughly destroyed under the Obama administration. So your your ways in, your ways out, then affirmative action, of course, throughout the last 60 years. So, like, there's a good reason to say, yeah, I'm not really interested in, in entryism. But then I kind of run into this weird heuristic or this paradox. And again, I'm aware that it's a fault in my model because every guy I talk to in these spheres who's anonymous or even a face lord, they're usually well put together, high middle class income or even upper class income, white people with a wife and kid or multiple children. And I get it. Exceptions to the rules prove the rule because not everyone's like that. And I see that all the time in my job because, again, I live in flyover country. I deal with rural, middle-aged, older white people who work in government and have for years that will never improve the situation in their town because, hey, we we like it how it is. Or, you know, we'd rather just keep the money for ourselves and not pay for, you know, a new fire station or whatever. Like there, there are certain grants that I can never close where I work because as long as that town clerk is alive, I can't close it. Cause I know damn well, she embezzled funds or whatever. And so really that, that, yeah. without, without doxing yourself, like, is there a, a templated explanation we can give for how something like that works? Sure. Um, I would tell people to just look up the process of under the Department of Housing and Urban Development for community block development grants. And just you can look that process up yourself. Um, and so, you know, that applies to towns and it can be like six hundred to three hundred thousand dollar projects, depending on what you're doing. So, I mean, like it's a lot of money and you're trying to fix your municipality or whatever. And 
uh, whether it's to create new you know job opportunities or to revamp a wastewater treatment plant there's all sorts of stuff you can do with it but neither here nor there it's i also had a question and this is again a very yeah. very broad question in your mind is there is this just a problem at every small town i we assume that it's it'd be worse in ghettos or low income areas but can we imagine any town or rural area where there isn't some level of this corruption occurring I'm sure it's a little bit of everywhere, but I can't speak for that. And that's why I'm generalizing. But I mean, for instance, uh, some other grants that I do where I work, again, I'm trying to be really broad. Because I work with such a rural, small town flyover America, I kind of, I mean, I made this joke today and I, and I, I use it all the time at this training that I do is, is that when you acquire this new equipment, whether it be a tractor or a road grader or a new fire truck, by these state statutes, I have to monitor this thing, unfortunately, and keep records of it, that you guys have it and it's in the right place for X number of years. And because of that, it needs I need to be able to find it at the fire station or find it at your, you know, your your city building or whatever. I don't want to find it at your cousin's garage. I don't want to go down to your cousin's property. I don't want to tag it. I don't want to get shot at. I don't want to return fire. That's a lot of paperwork. So please make sure it's at the proper location. That way, when we tag it, we photograph it, it's there. And I I, I kind of wrote an article about this for the Old Glory Club, and I just called it Frog Swanson because my life is kind of this very close to me being that like sort of quasi-reactionary libertarian figure that they make fun of who works in local government that deals with like crazy small town rural stuff in part. Cause it's always, there's always a shred of truth in sitcoms, but it's just like, damn, it's really a lot closer to reality than I'd imagine yeah. where I'm at. They but didn't it, know what to do with that character because in a, in a way he was vindicated for his hatred of government because the entire show is about waste and idiocy everywhere. Yeah. There, there really, there really is. Um, but it's, uh, to, to get maybe more on track here, I, I as I look at what my job is and where I work at, I realize that this is a very unique power node. It's a very tiny, very local, regional power node. But it's a node that if you're someone that wants to do, quote unquote, white fortressing, or you want to get out of the boon, you know, get out, out, out of the cities and you want to take over a small town. You better be friends with the people that get the Gibbs or help you get the Gibbs. Well, I have a question now. So when you are in a room in a conference hall at just like the one you're describing at the beginning, do you get the sense that there's more individuals like you in your age range? So if someone wanted to do what we just said, you know, it, do you get the sense that there's enough of people like you out there to make this or do you just feel alone in that crowd? Hmm. Uh, I would definitely say I'm alone in that crowd because there's no one that's my age. <laughs> they're all they're all my they're all my, they're all Gen Xers or they're all boomers or somewhere in between that age range. And and again, this kind of reminds me of the and I, again, I don't want to talk shit about people, but I'm reminded of that Walt Bismarck substack essay about like why he's not a white nationalist. Those are always great. Anytime you hear, uh, you, you get wind of someone like, here's why I'm not doing the thing I was doing before. I'm like, okay, this is you trying to apologize, but sound like you're smarter than everyone. It, whatever it is, it's always great. Yeah. And I mean, again, I'm not the only stuff I've seen between him. I know he did a recent interview with Alex Kashuda or something. I haven't w listened to it, but I, I know that him and Dave, the distributors have kind of gone back and forth on some things. But outside of that, I don't, I, I, I remember him most for his alt-right days. And so I, I, I kind of read it, and he moved, and he was in a less cosmopolitan, diverse area, and things changed. And it was very funny for me to read that, because I moved from a, you know, heavily non-white cosmopolitan area to rural, majority white flyover America, and I got more radicalized. Um, and that's a weird thing to say out loud. But it's because this will be on the air, but it doesn't matter at this point because I've, I've told that story before. But it's well, just it's important. It's important because what they will 
say against you, they'll try and levy against you is, oh, you believe this because you've had no exposure to that which you complain about. But you can say you absolutely have. Same with me. Like I, we lived in Toronto for quite some time, which is like a hub of multiculturalism up mm. here in Canada. Like my entire life from the early childhood has been surrounded by you know, a, a multicultural milieu. So I'm like, it's not based on ignorance. And it's surprising how many people don't believe that. And I think you're, you're becoming more radicalized due to the context is more admirable than someone who changes their context and says, like they, they change their temperature and they forget what it's like to be, you know, hot or cold. It's like, oh, maybe that was just a dream I had. All that bad, all my beliefs. I was that was a weird dream. I I moved to a new place and I changed my entire fucking political orientation. Uh, just the, in case the uh, official blood Sally position on Walt Bismarck, he's a great big fucking fool. Anyway, let's go ahead. <laughs> We're gonna do, dwell on that. But what a sack of dumb shit he is. Anyway, I don't I don't want to dwell on this. I don't want to dwell on this. He's a fucking retard. I do not want to dwell on this. Let's keep going. Thanks, Dimes. Uh, you know, back, back, back to you there, buddy. But no, uh, you well, you've heard Blood Satellite's position. I don't know the guy well hey, enough. Hey, to... well, well, Bismarck. I hope, I hope, uh, I hope you see a car accident, and uh, it makes you, um, it gives you bad dreams for years, and it makes you not want to ride in a car like Tom York from Radiohead. Anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about this. You know. All right, who's, moving on. Who, say, who, who moving, says moving this? Who, dimes, who, dimes, who, who dimes. says this? Shut, who says shut, it? shut, shut the fuck up. Thank you. So <laughs> back back to the subject at hand. Good Lord. I'm going to start calling you Nichols for how much you keep changing around here. Um, <laughs> so also again, for the folks on the name of my son, Nichols. Oh, uh, okay. Well, good to know. I, I can't That's wait. That's what we call them, dimes and nickels. Yeah, dimes and nickels, nickeled and dimed, chipped again, surrounded by pennies, too much bronze. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> see, this is why we get all the, the the crap out in the first hour. That way, the second hour behind the paywall is really good. I right, see. We see. This is just how the grift goes. Respect the yeah. grift. We, we we had a gentleman's agreement on a core that this would be dog shit for the free uh, half. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but uh to, so back onto this which is the for me at least looking at the small power node of government and there are a lot of small power nodes and even inside local government like your county commissioners are super important so like you have the your town your towns your township your 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 city or whatever and then you have the county that they're in so like if you live in What's a, an example I can use off the top of my head? So uh, let's say um, if you live in, say, the, the town of Amarillo, Texas, which is in the, the Texas panhandle, that is in Potter County. Your Potter County commissioners help determine what money gets spent in your county. And when grants are delivered to them uh, for the county of Potter County, they have to split it up based upon the districts. And it's kind of important to know who these people are and why they're running for office and that these people control parts of the purse strings. And that's really important for any aspect of government. And if you work with, say, a council of government, so sort of this multi-jurisdictional body that helps assist other counties or municipalities for grants or area um, agency on aging, et cetera, these triple A's, uh, ombudsman, etc. These are really small areas of power that people don't think are areas of power because these are people doing their day jobs, like grant administration or making sure that you know elderly white people in nursing homes aren't being abused or that their nursing home is sanitary or that regional transportation for uh, veterans or you know paratransit for disabled people is available. Believe it or not, those are areas of power. But no one considers them areas of power because it's not like, well, I'm controlling immigration policy. And don't get me wrong. Immigration policy is absolutely important. Um, you know, the entire like 200 miles south of the U.S.-Mexico border should be like turned to glass. And the Darien Gap needs a couple <laughs> of A-10 runs. But I'm just saying on a local level that I think there are things that the average Joe can achieve, especially if you live in like the suburbs or 
even in a smaller city, they're pretty accessible. These people have names and numbers and offices, and you can talk to them, and they're pretty open to hearing all sorts of crazy shit. Um, because they hear crazy shit from left wingers all the time. A voice of sanity would probably be a warm welcome for them because 90% yeah. of the time, depending on what you do, or if you represent an organization or a company, they have no idea who you are because no one tells them who they are. For instance, we had a guy for the old glory club, write This article, cause he's a, a congressional staffer. And a lot of people were kind of like shitting on the article. And I'm like, I don't think you get the point that there's one staffer out of hundreds of, and hundreds, if not thousands, of congressional staffers that is, like, based and listens to our guys. You know how many of those guys are total libtards? Like, even Ted Cruz's, like, interns and staff, a lot of them are libtards, or, or, or TPUSA kind of libtards. They are actively guiding the direction of policy and legislation that, you know, you are railing against on Twitter and trying to ratio Ted Cruz, which is actually... Um, easier said than done and or maybe for me because i don't have great twitter game or clout but it's those the things are important so i i guess to go back to the very beginning it's just i don't know where the don't bother with entryism meme comes in but if you scale down where you're looking at power there are things that are well worth investing your time and effort in and i think you touch up probably the most important part there which is just to cycle back to what we were talking about before. It's like, what do you actually want to do? Do you want status or do you want to accomplish a task? So when you engage in this whole discussion that we're talking about here, you should ask yourself, do you want to achieve power and control? You can do that on a smaller scale. And the reason we get so caught up in meta narratives and whatnot is because we don't actually want that. What we want to do is be a soldier in a big, sexy war. So the big headlines like immigration, yes, that is of crucial importance. Your ability as an individual agent to exert any sort of change on that discussion is very, very low if you just jump in that fight right now. But you can find these smaller scale battles where you could actually become noteworthy because that's what you actually want to be. And there's an interesting opportunity here because people think like i don't want small wins i want big wins but that that almost assures that you'll never have a win and i do think that if you were to achieve some small wins on the scale that you're talking we have almost a ready-made media apparatus to broadcast those wins which is to say that i don't think there's any small wins in this sense you know if you wanted to if you wanted to get in in a in a small town and and win some kind of you know you got funding for a project to put dung white tradesmen to work something like that you, you figure out how to play the game that's a story that if you wanted to could be broadcast across the entire conservative apparatus so with a small win you can turn it into into a big win but you don't go out hunting dragons to get that big win. That's a fool's errand. And you'll probably get swallowed up in that war. Just like you get swallowed up in the fucking Glenn Beck alt media machine or whatever. Whatever the example is like the best you could do is get hired for the Daily Wire. Is that what you want? I bet it isn't. You know, what I mean, yeah, like, same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like f figure out where you can have not only a win, but also sovereignty and also autonomy, because if you start to try and tackle these really big issues, especially if you're young, you probably only you have, you'll be able to broker a deal with some people you don't want to. And so don't even fucking bother. Find find a small win and then we will figure out how to make that into a big win later on. So, I, again, this, I think, goes back down to scale. And I, and I think that maybe one of the things that I anticipate people being really frustrated about is going to be people listening or looking at this and thinking like but the border's open but ukraine or israel or any you know or whatever pet issue or ethnic group you want to point the finger at i get it i do but how close are you and i to whispering in the ears of joe biden's like drug dealer you know we're not we're not there so I'm trying to work within the realm of what I know, and I get it. People are conservative about what they know the most. But I think it's kind of important to consider that 
when it comes to advertising, grant administration, grant writing, programs, that these are tangible things that the average right-wing guy who listens can do. And I get it. It can be really discouraging. I mean, it, you, you're not. We, we already kind of saw that with all of the school board meetings and protests where in certain places the fucking FBI was called in and arrested these people. But, I mean, there's going to be costs to what we do. But it, And I know that that's easy to say when I haven't been doxxed and I haven't really paid any major price for my beliefs, but it is... I, I, I'm a middling bureaucrat who works with a lot of a lot of taxpayer dollars. I'm very much embracing my patron saint, St. Matthew, about handling taxpayer money. <laughs> but it's it's important to consider because millions upon billions of dollars of your taxpayer money and money that just gets printed gets spent on McKinsey tech consulting firms area agencies, you know, councils of government and other NGO like institutions that are and out it, there for you to go in and if we could set a base camp there. Change. I would love to hear a bit more about McKinsey and Company and their relationship to all this as the global consultancy firm. So they're the ones there's money available. There's funds available and McKinsey and Company are just kind of vacuuming all that up. Is that a, a fair just, you know, pretend for five seconds that I'm a Canadian idiot and don't know how any of this works. Where sure. McKinsey sure, sure. company fit in. Uh, McKinsey and company is. Oh, boy, where to where to get started with McKinsey and company? Um, M McKinsey and company uh, has quite a bit. Uh, they are a management consulting company. They have been around since 1926 in Chicago, Illinois. They are part of one of the big three management consultancy businesses. Um, the other two, of course, are Bain and Company and Boston Consulting. And they have, you know, hundreds of locations in the United States. Uh, they make billions of dollars a year. McKinsey and Company, as of 2023, has 45,000 employees. Boston has about 30,000 and Bain and Company about 16,000, uh, according to the latest stats that I have in front of me. Uh, McKinsey & Company is one of the biggest contractors with the federal government as a sort of business consulting firm. They're not probably the biggest, but they are of the big three. You know, they're one of the biggest with respect to the feds. Um, and according to a recent article from the uh, Financial Times, and this snapshot was from the beginning of this year, so this is back in late January, and it's about how McKinsey's work as a prime contractor with the U.S. government fell last year, 2023, to its lowest level since 2014, new data shows, after the consulting firm was added back to a list of preferred suppliers. So typically, once you get a federal grant or federal contract, it's very hard to get off the list of preferred companies or preferred business status to, you know, not get money again next year. Uh, this is also why if you work in business or if you work in government, spend as much money towards the end of your fiscal year. That way you get the same budget again next year. Uh, and with respect to McKinsey, they uh, fell to 54.9 million US dollars um, previously from 71.1 million. Um, the peak, of course, was uh, the 142 million back in 2018. Now, this was the political crisis that would follow after and kind of cause them to circle down, which was the accusations that its work as a consultant with Purdue Pharmaceuticals represented a conflict of interest while also being a contracted entity out with uh, the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, they are also a prime contractor, so meaning they're not subcontracting work out, although they've done a lot of that in 2023. But most of the U.S. government's clients with McKinsey works specifically inside the United States Air Force, Defense Health Agency, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and USAID. Um, and so this is a lot of the stuff that they do. Uh, for example, if you are a senior partner, your hourly rate is $1,150. If you're just a regular business analyst at the beginning, it's $305 for an hourly rate that they can hmm. charge. Um, and these things are part of 
the billing arrangements that they have in these contracts. And again, this is just one example. I, I, um, I know in another stream that I did with uh, Patrick Casey a while ago, we were talking about um, Mackenzie Scott, uh, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife, and the billions of dollars that she's spending off of her divorce to go give to progressive causes. There are numerous tech consultancy firms out of California that do a lot of things um, with respects to the Department of Health and Human Services and Medicare and Social Security Office uh, to help keep their systems running. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars throughout several years, if not untold hundreds more, in kickbacks and the rest that are being used to keep the government as you know it, this you know GNC or whatever three-letter term you want to use, uh, afloat, running, and kind of manageable. Now, some parts of the government, for instance, like the Economic Development Administration, is actually incredibly straightforward and easy to work with. Other parts, for example, like the Social Security Administration, is a fucking nightmare. And anyone who's ever had to deal with the SSA knows it's a nightmare, whether you're actually going to the building or you work inside the SSA. And so these are things to consider about this consultancy crisis. This is that we talk about, oh, big pharma or big business or Wall Street or K Street. Well, a lot of it also exists in our consulting firms because government lives off contractors and subcontractors and consultants to tell them, here's your org chart. Here's how to do things and here's how to do it right. And here's what we can do for you as an analyst. And here's the product of it for everyone yeah. to see. And one uh, dimension to this, because people ask, why? Why is it like this? And there's a few reasons. But one that I've always found interesting is it's um, a way to dissipate accountability that large organizations, they're staffed by people and departments, and they love farming out their work to someone else they can blame. And if those people also farm it out, it's just this matrix where no one's ever to blame for anything, which is a bureaucrat's dream. So a lot of the risk of a decision will be offloaded to a consultancy firm. So no one gets fired if something fucks up. They can just blame this analyst over here. And it's actually strikingly similar to my industry, especially in digital marketing, where so much of the work and so many jobs are just making reports, reporting on campaigns, creating PowerPoints, and just interpreting data. It's all just interpreting data and emailing it back and forth. And you would think like, well, how how often can you do that? There's entire careers built off of that. That's all anyone's fucking doing anymore. It's interpreting data, summarizing those interpretations, and creating this giant web where no one gets fired anymore. That's what this is. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it. And I guess the question I also want to ask is, in your line of work, do you work... Have you done any stuff with local or with the I'm not familiar with how with how Canadian style federalism or devolution works, but have you done anything with the state? Yeah, so I worked on some uh, I worked on a campaign for again, not to dox myself, but this is hard. I work a campaign for an MP, which is a member of parliament, which would be something like a, a governor over there. There's an MP and an MPP. Um Anyway, I won't get into Canadian politics, but it was a pretty big role. Um, and I worked uh, for on a mayoral campaign. Um, these are all just for marketing and advertising campaigns. Nothing too, too deep into the how it's run or anything like that. Um, I'm trying to think here. And the, the rest of it's mostly nonprofits. But yeah, that's that's kind of the extent of it. My wife would be the one who worked in local government. Um, and I got, to, I got an intimate view of what that's like. It would have been a bit different than yours. So she would have just been working at a city hall. Um, so she might be the person on one end of the phone that you might have to deal with, just dealing with like the actual functioning of the city and trying to like make sure people get grants and things like that and de dealing at daily with, you know, just firefighters and garbage men and making that whole system run which to me was really interesting. I, I thought that was so cool. <laughs> she hated it. And so that's why she doesn't work there anymore. But she just found it boring. But I'm like, that's, you get to know what happens to the garbage? Like, what did tell me? Like, what the fuck's going on? What's, what's the fact that the firefighters hate the cops? I want to know everything about this. They, they operate like gangs, kind of. It's great. Anyway, she didn't like it, but that's the extent of my experience. 
you know, despite the fact that it is a center of power. I mean, we, we don't consider that. I maybe maybe some people do, and maybe I'm I'm not talking to the right people in the space. But like if we if we want and if we know that progressivism is anti civilization, being tough the, the whole woke is more correct than the mainstream thing. Well, well being tough on crime is white supremacist. We know because the majority of people who commit crimes are not white. Yeah. Right? You know, like we get it. We we know Will Stancil. We understand. Will Stancil, you yeah. fucking moron. That's an, I agree with him. Yeah, see, the, he's your fucking Walt Bismarck. You're about to go off too. Get no, I, he's everyone just, look at this. I, I actually, so this is a this this is my fun hot take. Is is that so? You know how again, this is all the stuff that you put in the first time. Like Lucas Gage will have like random messages that people send him, and I know for a fact that three or four of the like things that he's like posted on his Twitter account about like these like rabbis or other Jewish people calling him out were deliberately sent by other people that I know as mutuals on Twitter just to fuck with him. <laughs> and there's no self, there's like, there's like zero self-awareness whatsoever. And then on top of that, you have Will Stancil on like the left wing side of things. This like low IQ moron with like main character syndrome who has easily been given a fake dox and is like running with it and doubling down. He's like, I'm not doubling down on this. Look at all these other deleted tweets. It's Pepe Silva all over again, except it's Martin with the David Koresh PFP. And it's just like, oh my gosh, there are, there, we're surrounded by, you know, morons. It's, it's like he's going live. He's going prime time with his expose on how there's this secret conspiracy, this group where everyone's named both Sneed and Chuck. And they're trying to bring him down. Here's the thing about Will Stancil. I can't even get mad at him because he just keeps stepping on rakes very publicly and everyone's clowning on him. So I'm like, you know, I would see him as a loathsome person if he seemed like he was winning at life at all. But it's just like he hits the stage and everyone just makes fun of him. He walks into a room and every fucking woman's vagina leaps off her body and jumps off the fucking roof. I'm like, this is great. I love seeing a loser get made fun of forever. You know, <laughs> this is like it a is, mean, the mean part of the show. I'm sorry, everybody. I, I, it, you know, isn't it so bad? Because I think someone had pointed out a, a mutual of mine or maybe I don't know who it was, but he was just like, man, isn't it so depressing that like you're a white progressive activist working for a group that hates you and you're probably making like forty two thousand dollars a year and your life's a fucking joke. And I'm just like, I don't know. That's the more depressing reality of it all. And it's just like, mm. and he's got to double down because that's all that he can do. Right. And it's like when he announced that he's running, like all these other like progressives were just like, yeah, no more whitey. Like I'm going to go yeah. vote for the woman or the the brown candidate. It's just like, you know, will this the, is the cell is to the our side picked. is so simple. We go to these people and just say, look, would you for once in your life, would you like to not feel like shit? Would you like to not be made fun of would you would you just like to feel comfortable once because if you're surrounded by like black lives matter people you're at all times you've got pressure on you you know that these people don't like you you know to them you represent something abhorrent you're trying to help them but they they don't want you to help them but you know deep down that they'll never get help unless you do it wouldn't you just love to not feel that way anymore and I would say that to all the progressive, the white progressives who are just enslaved by that and used as, as as property or something like, you can get out and not feel like absolute dog shit every day of your life. And I'm just going to put that out there to them. Don't jump ship right now, but just there is a reality where you don't want to kill yourself every day, which is I'm sure how you feel anyway. You know how people will post like the meme with the, and this is what's going to get the ad revenue yellow dollar sign. You know how people have the the, the, the little memes about so, like the, the nice world of paradise that is like in between the, the noose outside of their bedroom. And yeah. everyone's like, come join <laughs> us. And it's just like for, for like white progressives, it, the, the noose on the other side is like FDR, like Ulysses <laughs> S. Grant. And Stalin being like, we're waiting for you. We're waiting for you. And then on like outside of the noose, it's like all of the like, you know, right wing people that are like, there's so much more reasons to live. And they, they choose the noose every time. It's just so sad. And literally just left. And then there's like one guy in the corner, son, your balls. <laughs>
talk to women, you know, anything like that, right? And the, the, of course, they, they they choose the FDRs every time. It's so depressing. Um, God, you know, I, I, I would, oh, Lord, make my enemies ridiculous. And he granted it or that awful Voltaire quote. But it's just like you look at it and it's just like it is ridiculous because this is. And again, regardless of what your opinion of Bronze Age pervert, and I know that you and I've talked about him a lot in the backdrop, is that the eternal sales pitch of why settle when you could be cool or you could be better is Lindy. It's never yeah. going to go away. And so there again, is I, something I, lurking I, in every man, which is like, this is why we love movies where the guy, the good guy snaps. Hey guys, why do you like breaking bad so much? Is it cause you like meth? Is it cause you like Albuquerque? No, it's cause like a smart white guy just fucking had enough and went to war with the system, went to war with everything that was like oppressing his idea of who he should be. And we love it. Every time we see it, we love it. And there is a divine savagery lurking in that. So like in, insofar as bronze age pervert and other vitalists, and, and this has occurred across time. There's always been someone in society in civilization or a few people who've been like returned to that form of 